fairs. Uh, we're here this Thursday morning, January 18th, um, to hear back on some of the work that we did in uh, Act 30, S17 last session. Um, and so we're gonna hear from uh, a few familiar faces uh, on the report and um, kind of the consequences or um, effects that, that that bill's had and that law's had for um, the future of the DSAS and sheriffs. So um, I'm pleased to have Annie Noonan here first. And Annie, uh, did you want to testify jointly? <laughs> Uh, yes, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for the record, Annie Noonan, um, I'm here with Sheriff Roger Marcoux. Good morning. Um, and uh, Roger and I, uh, along with um, uh, Gary Taylor, who was the former chief of police with St. Albans City, and with Sheriff Anderson, um, worked on, on the report uh, to a large extent. I know that you've got limited time to this morning. We have lots of witnesses. So I thought Roger and I talked about perhaps we would testify together if that if that's okay with the chair um, for efficiency. Plus, there are different pieces of this that you know I worked on more more than Rod and Roger on others. Um, the other reason we're not I just want to say this is um, I'm unable to be in the committee room today because I had foot surgery a week ago and I'm not clear to walk on my foot yet. So I'm all bandaged up. I could come in and get the sympathy vote, but I really think I really thought it'd be better if I just followed my doctor's orders and stayed off it for the rest of the week. So thank you for accommodating the, the remote uh, process and um, thank you for letting us talk about this. And I will try to go through if it's OK with you, the report. As it was written, it's um, it's 14 pages, but but a lot of it is just background information. So I'm just going to go through the highlights um, and uh, remind the committee, um, you know, a year out where we're at with things from um, from S17. So S17 was passed last session, and to a large extent, to institute reform sheriff reforms in the sheriff's departments for the county elected sheriffs. And I think everyone knows we have 14 elected sheriffs. Uh, essentially, Act. Uh, uh, let me say Act Thirty. Act Thirty imposed imposed additional oversight on the sheriffs from everything from a review of what the sheriff may be trying to um, sell or or uh, 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 give away whatever of any value during any transition period, <clears throat> and uh, that now has to go with some oversight to um, to the sheriff's executive committee and the uh, state uh, the the director of my department, state's attorneys and sheriffs. It also uh, put in a provision for clear, clearly put in a provision for conflict of interest that if a sheriff uh, uh, believes or perceives or the executive committee of the sheriffs believes or perceives that there's a conflict, the executive committee will review that issue and give uh, some decision to the sheriff as to whether the sheriff should or should not engage in any activity. Uh, the required annual financial disclosure under um, under Title III was made clear under Act 30, and the sheriffs have to uh, provide their financial disclosure by January 15th. In addition, uh, Act 30 asked for a model compensation and benefits policy, and I'll get to that later on in the report. It talked about the administrative fee, which is the 5% on the private contracts. Again, we'll come to that in a little bit. And it created a director of sheriff operation. Um, and I'll uh, mention that it also talked about a sheriff being accountable as to their work schedule. Where are where is a sheriff? Are they working in in Vermont? Are they working out of state? If they're out of working outside their area for more than three days, they are required to maintain a record of that. So if there's any question from uh, the public as to where the sheriff is, that has to be available to uh, in in record as to where they are. The other piece of this was to coordinate with the judiciary for court security services. I'm pleased to report that the judiciary worked very closely with the sheriffs and has a separate um, uh, report and budget request that they're going to come forward with um, that we support as a department, the sheriff's support and the judiciary. So I feel like it's a, it, they did a very good job of involving many stakeholders in that. And I think you're gonna see that separately from the judiciary. Yeah, I and, just wanted to interrupt you really quickly, Annie. Um, my apologies and say for the committee's context and everybody, uh, all the stakeholders that 
Today, I wanted to focus on this report, and we will make time to talk about the courthouse security as a separate block of time and, and testimony with you know Terry Corsonas and, and other folks. Um, I think the VSCA wanted to have representatives in the room for that as well. So we definitely uh, related to this and the bill, of course, but or the Act 30, the law, I should say now, but um, wanted to just make sure that um, the committee knew that we're putting a pin in that, but it hasn't been forgotten. Great. And the other was <clears throat> the issue of the re relief from abuse orders where the sheriffs are assisting people who have uh, property retrieval issues under relief from abuse, primarily often domestic violence um, victims. And uh, that was another piece of this that we had to look at and absorb. So most of the report for the next few pages goes through what are the duties of the sheriff. Um, and it's just a whole laundry list of what a sheriff generally does, what is required of them by statute, what is required of them by policy. Um, <clears throat> In essence, uh, what we had to look at for policies is uh, not only operational policies for a sheriff, but operational policies around personnel and fiscal. So very briefly, we've recommended that the sheriffs establish a policy committee. We have, we have in fact, put out <clears throat> policy um, guidelines uh, that are available for this policy committee to look at, and they essentially were those that uh, Sheriff Marcou uses in his department in in uh, um, in many areas. So the committee is supposed to be looking through those and deciding which of those uh, are adoptable as is, which of them need some edits, uh, which of those um, are actually set by statute and cannot be edit edited. So for example, Act 56 or federal law around um, military USERA, state law around parental family leave. There are some things that the sheriffs have to adopt as policy that are not in their purview to edit in any way. There are others that are that are that were provided by Sheriff Marcou so that they serve as sort of a starting point. As you all know, it's easier sometimes to edit a document than it is to create the document. And Sheriff Marcou provided a, a, a list of these with, um, and most of these have links. If anybody here wanted to see them, we can get you a link to those policies. I didn't embed it into the report, but they are available. Uh, areas where the, we will be helping, the department will be helping the sheriffs are pr primarily around uh, labor relations and HR issues, whether it's hiring, promotion, job descriptions, development of employees, employee assistance programs. We will be helping the sheriffs with those policies from our department, primarily um, both the director of sheriff operations and myself and other people in our department will help the sheriffs with those. But obviously, we're not going to be uh, identifying things like, um, you know, proper pat patrol procedures. That's really the law enforcement uh, uh, groups um, and the committees. Uh, th that's their expertise, not ours. Um, one of the things that we did do was we looked at um, ensuring that we say sheriffs should be trained um, <clears throat> several times a year and new sheriffs should be trained within 45 days of taking over the office. Um, <clears throat> fiscal and accounting training is very much available from the auditor of accounts, uh, Doug Hoffer's office, and um, has has a very clear um, manual. He offers that training um, to not only the sheriffs but the sheriff's staff because most of them have a bookkeeper, uh, financial people in their office, and he does that and has agreed to work with us on fiscal and accounting training for the sheriffs. Um, they, <clears throat> as you know, the sheriff's departments are that odd. Um, combination of both a public and private operation. So the sheriff's salaries are paid and benefits are paid through our department. And the transport deputies, 24 transport deputies are paid through our department. And then the sheriffs employ their own staff as sheriffs, dispatchers, bookkeepers, um, and all of that. So <clears throat> they're, they have to maintain a, a pretty comprehensive set of books and accounting um, because they also have their private contracts. Um, so they have a they have a pretty su substantial lift in terms of accounting. I think some of them do very well. Uh, I think for them so that they get some help in terms of all of that. One of the other pieces of this was to talk about a comparable salary structure for the sheriffs. And in this, you'll see that <clears throat> what we're recommending to a large extent is an apples to apples. Who do the sheriffs um, compare best to within, within the um, state system, for example? And we had identified that we felt that the sheriffs identified best with the 
um, state police majors based upon the uh, the level of duties they have to they have to uh, um, perform, the supervision, the budgeting, all of that. We felt that they compare best to a VSP major. Um, we will continue to look at that with the Department of Human Resources, um, and uh, I I think that. <clears throat> um, similarly to what I had done with the director of sheriff operations, which has been very well vetted through DHR, the DHR staff, I think we're going to be working, continue to work with the Department of Human Resources to identify, is there a different uh, salary model for the sheriffs? Their salaries are set in statute. The question is, are their salaries commensurate with what we are asking them to do? Um, easier was trying to figure out what a sheriff should pay their non-state. I want to keep saying that the non-state deputies, because the state deputies are under a contract under our department. And they, <clears throat> so the deputy sheriffs that they employ, that state, the sheriffs can look at what the transport deputies get or what other law enforcement officers get. Um, we've identified that. We've identified similar uh, job descriptions in state government for their civilian support staff, whether it's a dispatcher. Admin, administrative assistant A or B, financial services directors. There are plenty of job descriptions within state government that show a range of salary that a sheriff could, could start with for those civilian support staff that they employ in their, in their sheriff's department. I don't think that will be a big lift for the sheriffs. I think it's just a matter of the sheriffs agreeing upon some of these job descriptions do seem relevant. I think that, that they'll be able to do that. The other piece of comparability, and when you look at a benefit, um, a, a, a compensation package, is what do the sheriffs get in terms of retirement? And I'm going to let Sheriff Marcou, if I can, uh, talk to this issue. But I just want to say, you know, we've been working closely with um, State Treasurer Mike Pichak and his staff, um, Tim Duggan, <clears throat> to identify a way forward. We've been asking for some revision for the sheriffs. Um, uh, and Roger will explain that, you know, it's very, it's all over the place as to where their, their staff are located, but we feel like we've have a good model here with this group G retirement system that was established for corrections. And I believe the state treasurer agrees that this would be an option for our sheriff. So let me have, turn this to Roger. I believe, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Roger Mark, who the Royal County Sheriff. Um, I believe that uh, perhaps the committee is somewhat aware of some of the retirement uh, conversation that's been going on, but after six or seven years of me being personally involved, trying to, to um, find an, an equitable uh, retirement for the non-state paid deputies, uh, uh, the, the folks in, in Mike Pichek's office and, and uh, the sheriffs uh, have found the newly formed Group G, uh, which is a 20-year retirement, which was formed, I believe, last year, uh, namely for corrections uh, officers, uh, is a very, very good fit. It's, a, uh, it's a, a system where the employee pays the true cost of the, um, of the benefit. So, um, and, and, um, so we're working hand in hand. There's a, there's a bill out right now, which I think you're all aware of, uh, but um, we're in hopes that that's going to make it through uh, the legislative procedure this year. And then we can uh, maybe come online for retirement, uh, which would be equitable with uh, other law enforcement agencies, not only municipalities with Beamers, but with uh, uh, the, the Group C, uh, which is uh, aimed at uh, state law enforcement um, uh, officials. So, um, I think enough said on that, but we're we're, you know, fingers crossed that uh, that's going to help professionalize our group because at least on that piece we're going to have some equity. So. Sheriff Marku, I think that that bill is H five eighty five. Yes. Okay. Um, so I um, <clears throat> I'm glad to hear that there's appears to be some agreement between the treasurer's office and <laughs> sheriff's association on a a path forward there. I know that's been a long long conversation. So um, we'll definitely hear more about that. Thank you very much. Okay. So the next section of this report is talks about the 5% contract administration fee. <clears throat> and I know that that was a, that has been a 
a big flashpoint for lots of people um, in discussing the sheriffs. I do I think it's really important to just consider this that you know the sheriffs, um, as I said, you know they are they are a um, strange uh, configuration of public and private money, and the private money comes in through contracts, and those are contracts that can be with you know construction companies, um, but also with state government, um, Department of Mental Health, Department of Children and Family Services, Department of Corrections, for services that that those agencies can't do themselves, um, <clears throat> whether it's sitting with um, you know, a kid or transporting kids, whether it's, um, um, you know, I mean, UVM had a contract with sheriffs for a number of years. Uh, sheriff Marcoux and other sheriffs uh, were very much involved in monitoring for security, the homeless program during the pandemic where we had the hotels, but the hotel owners said, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll house people, but we want some security on site. There are lots of, there are lots of ways that the sheriffs are supporting <clears throat> private businesses in Vermont and public public entities in Vermont. And that 5% fee is, um, it was written in to say the sheriff has the right to uh, put that in as a administrative fee um, for, for administering the contract, monitoring performance, hiring people, and owning the general liability um, if something goes wrong in terms of those the insurance. I think a big piece of what, I, um, I think a lot of folks don't understand is that the sheriffs often are using the money that they take in from those administrative fees for what I call their unfunded, unfunded um, obligations. And I think a couple of examples. So we have 24 state transport deputies that go over to the correctional facilities and they pick up people and they move them over to court for their hearings. And sometimes they're doing, you know, they're moving people, helping DOC occasionally move people around, but primarily that's what they do. They're in the courtroom during the hearing uh, as added security for the judge and all the people in the courtroom and for the defendant. <clears throat> we don't pay for the cars. We pay the sheriff's mileage to use that car when the sheriff uses that car, but the sheriff buys that car. So it's a state program with state employees running people back and forth for which the sheriff is purchasing those cars. The sheriff is also uh, buying the uniforms for the state de deputies. The sheriff is also equipping the, sh the, the cars and equipping the state deputies. So that's like an example. Um, even last year with the, um, ref uh, the RFA property retrievals, <clears throat> It used to be that local, whoever the law enforcement agency was, you know, could would uh, be asked to do that. And then the bill Act 30 said, no, the sheriff should do all that work <clears throat> without any money to reimburse them for that. Okay, you know, we we reimburse them if they if they're using a state transport deputy. But if they're transporting, which we're very busy these days with transports, the um, the sheriff might have to use their own their own folks, and so they're they're paying their their own deputies to do that work, and there was no money put into their budgets. In addition, the county um, this year started rolling back some of their support for the sheriff's departments, saying, "Well, we really shouldn't be paying for X, and we shouldn't be paying for Y." So a big part of what the sheriffs use their administrative fee for is to basically support their staff and their infrastructure and their comparabilities. And um, I just just wanted to put that out there that that you know people it's not it's I think there's a perception that whatever comes in that the sheriff is putting that right into their wallet and that is very far from the truth um, in terms of what is actually happening and I think that that's important. So what we recommended, having said all that, is that what we think that a reasonable cap and restrictions on the use of the five percent fee. Um, could be examined. It should be examined versus in, in terms of um, what is fair and uh, and comp, uh, fair comparable salary and benefits, and what does a sheriff need to be able to support the the infrastructure of running their offices, their departments, and their equipment. So we have talked about that. Um, that that's a conversation that needs to still be ongoing among the sheriffs and among um, our department. Uh, because we've been asked to identify what we think would be a reasonable cap and restrictions on that. We are working towards that. I do think that that we would be, um, we are being very uh, careful about advising the sheriffs uh, about 
that money when it goes towards anything towards salary compensation for their staff or themselves. So we are working on that, um, trying to come up with something that I think people would feel okay and supportive of with the sheriffs. But that was a big flashpoint of all of this. Um, okay. Then um, complaints about the sheriff, we basically put out a just a, a simple thing. And let me explain it this way. <clears throat> the sheriffs can get complaints about about themselves. They can get complaints about their staff, their their non-state employee staff and their state employee staff um, and, and other operational issues. So <clears throat> the easiest way to say this is it would need to be it would need to be examined like who who gets to examine the complaint. If the sheriff gets a complaint about one of their staff members, Obviously, the sheriff needs to look at that. They need to decide if it's an internal policy violation, something small, something large. Uh, obviously, they have to examine it against whether or not it meets the definition of professional misconduct as outlined under the law and Act 56. And if so, they have to immediately work with the Criminal Justice Training Council by, by filing all those reports that go to, to the council. They also have to try to determine whether or not they think it should be referred to another law enforcement agency if they think that it's a violation of the law. So in all areas, whether it's a complaint about a sheriff, a sheriff staff member, um, it really, all of those three things have to be examined. Internal policy violation of a non-serious nature, internal policy violation of a serious nature, which of those go over to the, the council, which of those go to the council and or law enforcement for further investigation. So um, that is sort of what would be the model for all three. Check this box, that box and this box. <clears throat> so we think that um, uh, obviously if there's a complaint about the state transport deputies, our department would need to be advised also because we, those employees fall under a collective bargaining agreement, we would need to make sure that all of their all of their rights under the collective bargaining agreement are, are um, followed, um, even if something is being referred to the council or to another law enforcement agency, we need to make sure that the employee is advised of their rights and their right to union representation. So um, none of the other employees in the sheriff's departments are unionized. So this piece only applies to the 24 state transport deputies. Okay. Um, the other piece is to create an advisory commission. Uh, we've been working on uh, among the sheriffs as to trying to look at models for that. Obviously, there is the state police advisory commission, which is a larger organ, a larger group of people than perhaps we might put together. But we think we would be looking at. Um, we've talked to the council itself, the council members, and the council staff about you know who might be appropriate groups to put on this. Obviously, we're looking at stakeholders, interested stakeholders. That would include not only law enforcement agencies, state government agencies, but also advocacy organizations mm -hmm. that represent marginalized communities, people with disabilities, um, and all, all other groups um, that we would, you know, LB, L, LGBTQ, um, and all the other groups that we would think we would want to involve in um, an advisory commission. Yeah. Uh on this, uh, the the state police advisory council is one organization that that advises the commissioner. That you may or, or may not know how that works, but but they have one internal investigations unit. They have one set of policies. So and so the right from the beginning of this conversation or this testimony right to now, we have to have standardized policies. We have to make sure that internal investigations are all done in the same way, in the same professional way. And so this is a, um, a process here. Uh, you, have, uh, um, uh, you have personnel policies uh, that may be different in Essex County, a small county, uh, as, as opposed to Chittenden County. So we have a lot of work to do, but this is only gonna work if we can standardize everything. Uh, very, very important uh, uh, to have that transparency, but I think the foundation has to be laid uh, in a way that um, everybody uh, is, is trained the same way as to how this is going to work and, and, how, and the responsibilities of, of this commission if we can get it up and running.
and we will rely a lot on the council, on the council staff members, particularly when it comes to um, them explaining all of the aspects of Act 56, which is the oversight that the council has for, for certified law enforcement officers. Um, and I, you know, we always presume that everybody fully understands it, but I don't think we should make that presumption. I think we should be training at least once a year, maybe twice a year with the council on anything the council thinks sheriffs as law enforcement officers should know or do. Um, and so we will rely a lot on them for, for their help on this. Um, one of the things I talked about was the sustainable funding model for the sheriffs. Um, you know, we, I, I don't feel like we can do that without the help of like JFO. And uh, I have not had the opportunity to really sit down and start that conversation with, with JFO. But honestly, um, right now, for when I look at the FY25 budget, um, I, don't, I don't think that we're going to see any additional shift for more state money coming into the sheriff's um, budget uh, at this point. And I think we'll have to be looking down the road a bit. And I think we would need some projections from, from um, JFO to tell us what that might look like. The, as I mentioned, the counties that got together, the county um, clerks uh, or um, side judges, I guess it was, that got together and um, started to pull back some funding on some areas for some of the, some of the sheriff's departments that was, uh, that's, been a bit of a, a problem for some of them, um, but they felt that they were perhaps uh, supporting um, some positions that the that, that that they shouldn't have been. So we're kind of need to look at how that what that impact will be this year. Um, the other thing that Act Thirty said is we should increase efficiency. We think we are going to be doing that by standardizing policies, providing information about best rates of pay. Uh, employment applications, things that we can standardize actually will reduce their costs. We believe that. And then uh, recommendations for better oversight. We think that the director of sheriff oper operations is the first step in doing that. Um, you might know that one of the things you do when you create a position in state government um, is you have to first do your job description, job specification, and then work with the Department of Human Resources for their input. Um, at, on this, we have done that, and DHR has been very helpful to us on this. And we um, have been looking um, to have uh, uh, it's an exempt position. It was it was a, not it was created from a vacancy that we had within the sheriff's transport when they unionized. Uh, t there were 25 positions. I asked for one of those positions to be held out of the bargaining unit with the thought that at some point the program and the sheriffs might need more assistance um, and it should basically be a more more or less a managerial position. And when uh, Act 30 was being uh, and S17 was being uh, S17 was being debated, uh, that came up. You know, is there a way to have a position? And I said, well, good news is I have a position number we can use, and I have it in the budget we can use. So there was no no need for a new position number or new funding. We've been able to work um, work through that with with what we had existing. Uh, we are um, we are have talked to a few people on outreach for. Uh, interest in the position, um, and I think we will be able to be moving forward on that very soon. So that's sort of what all the news that's fit to print from Sheriff Marku and myself. I hope that if anybody has questions, they'll they'll ask. Thank you. Um, I have a few, but I want to open it up to the committee first. Anybody have any initial? questions after hearing the thank you for summarizing that report i highly recommend everybody on the committee take a look at that um one of my uh overarching questions for us annie and roger is um are there other than some of the budgetary conversations that we we'll need to have uh to take up some of these recommendations <clears throat> are there policy recommendations that we would need to act on this year in order to operationalize any of the things that are in the report? Um, I don't think so. Um, yeah, obviously 
the the, the committee is going to have to decide on on if they want to continue uh, uh, with the five percent uh, administrative fee, which is really um, um, pretty important uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, but there's so many policies that we can do, uh, you know, without any, you know, involvement. They're just pretty much standard uh, uh, things. And, you know, there may be some some budgetary issues down the road. If we got a director of operations and we just, you know, the, that person and DSAS decides, look, we, we really should have a, a uniform um, in, internal investigations policy and we have to hire somebody or put something in play like that. But that's that's down the road. But I think we're good to go right now uh, with a lot of this. Probably the only thing that I'm, that's out there that is in, also noted in this report is the retirement bill. Um, you know, I think a big push for the sheriffs on that is they were they were essentially being the training ground for people who would come work for a sheriff and then leave to go to a, a municipal plan that had a 20 year and out plan. And I remember that um, former senator and appropriations chair Susan Bartlett came in and she came in her in, in her capacity as a uh, a town select board person saying we're watching our sheriff's department train and lose and train and lose. And to a large extent, they were all going to local to Stowe and to Morristown. They were going to other municip municipal. So um, supporting the Group G retirement option, as Roger mentioned, which is will be paid for by the employee themselves, doesn't really have a big appropriations impact, but it definitely is a policy decision. Um, we'd really like to see that happen this year. And the treasurer has said that um, he thinks we would be able to um, institute it by January of 2025. Representative Hooper has a question. Good morning. <clears throat> uh, you both just said that the G plan would be paid for completely by the employee, or will you get uh, something for an employer contribution otherwise? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't really make that clear. I believe that the employee is going to pay about 12%. Yeah, and and then there will be contribution by the employer, but at the end of the day, uh, I don't think that you're going to run into the the deficit problems that you have with some of the other current programs. And I'll follow my sword and, and say that um, uh, Treasurer Pichik or his representatives are the true experts, and to the best of my knowledge, uh, this is going to be cost neutral. Yeah, I'm, and I'm sorry. Thank you, Bob. I didn't mean to. I meant to say that, that it would be absorbed by the by the participants and the and the employer, uh, and that was that was always sort of the hold up in terms of trying to figure out where to move the sheriffs to, because at one point we had looked at, at um, the Veemers plan, and the question when when it ran against the actuarial numbers, it was it would have cost the Veemers plan some money that they felt they didn't want to invest, uh, you know, rightfully so. They want to keep the plan upright. And we all know that that's a challenge these days. Thank you. Am I correct in remembering that there's about half of the sheriff's offices elected to be in Group F? And so there are folks that are in the state system now, and then there are a number of sheriff's offices that and employees that are not? Yes. Um, uh... There's a number of sheriffs that are in Group F, and there's a number of sheriffs that are in the Vermont Municipal Employees Retirement System, Beamers, and there's maybe a couple that are not involved at all in any retirement. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the model finance and benefit policy. And I'm, um, that we require, um, what's the kind of timeline on operationalizing that? Are you thinking that you'll hire the director position soon and then have them sort of be responsible for implementing those recommendations? Yes, yes, exactly. And, um, and, <clears throat> And working closely with Department of Human Resources, um, I, I, I've had conversations with um, Commissioner Fastigi. Um, they, as you know, that all, that department's very busy 
Um, and during the point that we were working on this, Beth uh, really didn't didn't uh, and her staff didn't have the capacity to basically pull themselves off of some of their other projects. But I think that we will continue to work with them by by basically giving them um, stuff to review. As I said, sometimes it's easier to be handed something and to say, can you look at this and tell us if it makes any sense? Um, it's sort of like, you know, I, you know, what I did with the director of sheriff operation job spec is that I wrote the whole thing um, and then presented it and said, hey, can you look through this and what do you think? Um, so I think we'll be doing the same thing. We'll have the director of sheriff operations try to really do, this was preliminary research that was based on um, information that's you know uh, that was available on the web and stuff but you know uh, uh, what really has to happen is very fact-based review and research and that's what we hope to accomplish and and present to um um the uh, as part of the the proposal roger did you have a question um chair mccarthy uh one thing you had asked about um any legislative action maybe by the committee but uh there's this um, conversation about level three versus uh, level two oh, yeah. sheriffs. And, you know, it, it's it's my thinking uh, that this could be taken up and it's not a constitutional issue. Uh, um, I, I know I heard in Senate GovOps that the, the experts or, or an, or an an expert said it was a constitutional amendment issue. However, um, that is something that uh, that even within the association, there's different thoughts on it. And I think that I'm I have a different thought on it than, than our president, uh, uh, Sheriff Anderson. Uh, but uh, that is something that, um, you know, as we look to professionalize the sheriffs, that that conversation should be had and and. Um, so I just wanted to, to bring that up. Actually, and that raises another point. <clears throat> so you are probably aware that right now in the statute, it says that um, if a sheriff is not level three, if they're level two, that they're that they're set, they take a ten percent salary reduction. Now here's the weird thing: if you have a sheriff who has no certification, the statute is silent. So one might presume that when that original language was passed, there was some thought by the legislature that said, um, you know, well, if you're not fully certified, you're going to take this piece of a salary cut. Well, if you're not certified at all, um, what do we pay you? You know, what 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 salary cut can we employ? This statute is silent. So if I were to say to someone, well, you're not certified, I'm, you know, we're cutting your salary 30%. I don't have any standing to do that right now. So that would be something that is that is a note in this report. It would be really helpful if we could clean up that section of the statute and decide what what difference difference in terms of a percentage pay do you pay someone who's not certified whatsoever? That would be very helpful because I know that the sheriffs and I have talked about this. And they, you know, we've all come up with, well, maybe it should be X, maybe it should be Y. And I said, yeah, but I can't do that without having somebody come back on me and say, show me where it says that I, I, you know, I mean, maybe logically I could say, well, I'm going to cut you 10% because there's clearly you're not certified, but you're not even certified at level two. Now, what do I do? And there's nothing there. So if we could clean up that provision of the statute, come up with a, come up with a number that the legislature thinks is appropriate, I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to uh, uh, implement that. Thank you. Other questions for the department or Sheriff Marku before we hear from Sheriff Anderson? I, I didn't want to have the two sheriffs engage in a debate over this particular issue this morning. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. And we're thank available you. for future questions from anybody, email or, or in the committee. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much for presenting the report initially for us. Thank you. Right, so I want to invite Sheriff Anderson up. Welcome back. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. So uh, if you'd introduce yourself for the record and I uh, wanted to hear your thoughts and feedback on the, the report and anything else that has to do with the, that you'd like to share with us about the current state of uh, the sheriffs in Vermont, that'd be great. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, committee. Uh, for the record, Wyndham County Sheriff Mark Anderson, and here in my capacity as the president of the Vermont Sheriff's Association. Uh, very quickly, I just want to talk about the Sheriff's Association. We represent 13 sheriffs, 13 independent organizations with shared responsibilities, with different expectations of our communities. Uh, and so it can sometimes be nuanced in how I respond, uh, but I am here to represent the Sheriff's Association. I will be very intentional when I'm representing myself, uh, and I'm happy to speak specific to my agency, uh, but this is very broad. Um, uh, this report is uh, a, a lot of work. Uh, Annie uh, did, did uh, hear host work on this. It was pushing a rock uphill in some regards. Uh, and so I, I appreciate uh, the effort that went into it. Uh, so to start off, the Vermont Sheriff's Association supports the body of work. Uh, we, uh, there's nuance as we get into the, the weeds on any one issue. Uh, as one can expect representing 13 entities, um, but generally we support the work. Um, you heard a uh, uh, reference to some disagreement that Sheriff Marku and I have. Um, that is respectful, professional, we're good uh, disagreement because we're, we're looking at it through different lenses. Uh, so the, I think that's where if uh, future legislation does come forward, uh, those are opportunities for the legislative process to work out. Um, that said, I, I'm not going to go into as much detail uh, as Annie did. Uh, happy to dive in anywhere the committee wants to ask questions or, or would like me to explore more. Um, but just briefly, I'm going to go through the points. Um, as far as the association is concerned, uh, skipping to page I it's five um, with regards to policies. If you step into office, you're there and your resources are what's there. Generally, the Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs means call Annie. That's what it means to a sheriff. It doesn't mean we have an attorney helping us. It doesn't mean we have IT support helping us. It's not to say that these things don't exist, but to a sheriff, they generally don't because we have some things that are funded by the state, some things funded by the county, and some things entirely funded by ourselves. Uh, so with that, having a standard model policy uh, manual that is handed to a sheriff saying, good luck, is better than walking in the door and having no one to greet you to say good luck and just figuring it out on your own. Um, so broadly, we support uh, the policies, uh, the direction of the policies. Many agencies already have these policies. Uh, what was good about this uh, report is that some agencies said there's a policy for that. And we said, yeah, here's three versions. So the association already contributes to that, but I don't always, uh, as a member of the association or as president of the association, have a look into what every policy an organization has without having the shred of a second to say, hey, what do you have? And that sheriff having the shred of a second to respond with what they have and then taking the time to read it. So um, to that end, uh, we uh, support uh, having the pol our model policies developed, which then we can tune uh, to the specifics of our operations. Some agencies are very in-depth on law enforcement. They need to have law enforcement uh, deep policies. My agency does not use uh, stinger uh, deflation devices. The, hey, car's in a pursuit, let's pull spikes across the road, pop the tires. We don't use them. So I don't have that policy. I don't need that policy because we never purchased them. Uh, we have a very, um, very restrictive pursuit policy because generally speaking, we believe that pursuits will result in death or serious bodily injury. So only when we believe that our pursuit would be more beneficial to the public do we engage in them. Generally, we can find the person who ran from us. We're very good at our job. <laughs> um, with regards to training, uh, talked uh, during S-17 during last session uh, about, uh, about basically offering the sheriff who has uh, limited resources an opportunity to have a shared understanding of what their job is entailing. They are guided by the rails of statute. Those things do happen. If they say, uh, if someone says you need to serve civil process, they will serve civil process. However, 
if they don't know that trustee's process or uh, uh, writ of possession or writ of attachment and all things that are part of civil process have certain rules. They might not know until they make the mistake and then they're sued and then they have the personal liability. So teaching that before the mistake is made is helpful, but we need legal counsel on it because civil law is difficult um, to say the least. With regards to uh, compensation, um, I'm gonna bifurcate this uh, specific to the sheriff themselves. You heard Sheriff Marcoux speak about the 5%. Sheriffs generally want to be paid equitably. I don't think I said that word right, but I think you know what I mean. We wanna be treated fair. Um, if it's the 5%, fine. If it's a state salary, fine. If it's a county salary, fine. If it's the lottery, probably not fine because you have to hope for it. Yeah. We want to be treated um, as professionals. We want to be compensated fairly. We want to have uh, anything that any other employee would expect as they talk to their employer. Uh, we're unique in that our employer is to a degree the voters. It's not really a body that you sit down and say, let's discuss what salary is. And so where does it come from? It comes from government. Sheriff Mark, who already uh, shared, we don't, or maybe it was Annie, uh, we don't see that our uh, change in our salary coming from the general fund. We just don't. It's been the same way for over, I think, 30 years. Close to 50. If we haven't changed in 50 years, if we change it today, okay. But then what and where does that funding come from? We know that budgets are always the tight point. So does the system um, raise eyebrows at time? Sure. But we also have sheriffs who say, I don't need 5%. I'm treated fairly and I'm investing this in my department, in my staff, in our cars. Um, with the 5% shares are often, uh, and you heard Annie speak to this, we're subsidizing the state of Vermont. We're subsidizing the counties. We're subsidizing the judiciary. We're subsidizing our municipalities. Uh, so we're not really raising taxes, but we are still subsidizing, which is kind of an interesting uh, feature of our departments. But it's the current design. With respect to our staff, we're in a competitive employment market. We have a number of agencies uh, surrounding all of us who are uh, often struggling with employment. Uh, we have a number of sheriff's departments who are flush with staff, but then they're stolen away. So we work to remain competitive. Like any other business though, we have the market demands or the market pressures. And so when I say I need a $100,000 contract with the town uh, to justify the position. And the town says, hmm, no, we can do it for 80 grand with the neighboring police department. I have a market pressure fighting against what I do. So there's already checks and balances built in by the, the sheer nature of economics um, on what limits or constraints our contracts as we deliver services. Uh, we uh, can skip a couple of the bullet points just because I think they're all tied into that broad statement. Um, with regards to retirement, um, I'm not going to dive too deep unless you have questions, uh, other than to say uh, we strongly support H585. Um, I know that's not on, on the discussion today, um, but that is something that we believe will be helpful for the departments that are struggling with employment. Um, I was looking at my department's uh, numbers over probably about the last uh, 15 years. We've employed roughly 200 people. I don't have 200 people. I will assure you that, but <laughs> most of them are still in law enforcement professions. They were taken by another agency. I just had two deputies taken by another agency. Um, so it's just, it's, we're always the training. Um, that's it's how it was when I started. What are you fully staffed at? What's your number? I have 41 as of last week. My <laughs> uh, uh, No, that was with oh, okay. uh, 41 uh, at 43 before they yeah. left. Um, and the, um, that said, I have, I think 16 full-time staff. I might be uh, uh, plus or minus one or two. Uh, followed by a variety of, I call them per diem staff, uh, and that's uh, 41 uh, sworn as well as civilian employees. So I have uh, administrative staff, I have dispatchers, uh, as well as deputies. Uh, 
the way we're able to absorb it is I cross train people. And so I have an animal control officer, which was intended to be a civilian position, uh, who wanted to become a deputy. It works. Uh, I have a dispatcher who wanted to become a deputy. It works. Uh, so I'm able to absorb some of those pressures in my operation, uh, but not everybody does that type of cross training. It does come with its own um, detriments, such as when I need a dispatcher and a deputy, I can't pull that person. But uh, right now I'm sitting pretty strong on staff, so it's not uh, detrimental, even though I lose people to other agencies. Um, the... With regards to addressing complaints of existing in statute uh, is already um, a policy under Title 20 about agencies adopting an internal affairs program. Uh, so every uh, law enforcement agency in the state of Vermont is required to have that. It has uh, set out the requirements to adopt that. If they don't adopt it, they are subject to the uh, Criminal Justice Council's model uh, policy. Uh, so it exists. Uh, in that regard, the cases are investigated. Failure to investigate it falls on the agency head. Uh, so uh, sheriffs are very attuned to that responsibility. The, uh, if it is a complaint about me, uh, the council is also subject to those responsibilities through Act 56. Uh, so I'm not investigating myself. The council investigates me. Um, there's also, uh, we have the Ethics Commission, which has its own uh, resolutions through the Attorney General uh, to conduct investigations, as well as the state's attorney in each county. Um, so not my bailiwick. Um, I'm still talking and learning about the Ethics Commission, uh, but I did file my disclosure. Um, so, I mean, there's certainly uh, remedies uh, with regards to it. Uh, talking about the um, uh, establishing, I think, uh, I forget the specific title and I don't see it right off the top, but um, I'm going to call it the Sheriff's Advisory Commission or the similarity to the State Police Advisory Commission, Sheriff Mark, who already mentioned, it becomes very difficult uh, to have a statewide body that's going to analyze 14 different independent organizations, policies, and how they are uh, reflected in each county, um, especially when I don't have a policy on sting or spike strips. And maybe, uh, I'm not sure who would, but maybe Sheriff Mark who has one. And so the differences of my policy to his policy. Um, the, um, not to go too far into the discussion on this, unless you'd like me to, um, Act 74 was a report done by the Criminal Justice Council uh, to reflect on Act 56, the professional regulation law uh, for law enforcement. Uh, so that is a report that you do have back, and I hope you look at that as well. Um, but it also contemplates the same issue, which is when law enforcement agencies report to the council an issue, they're analyzing by the specific policy of that agency, and we're finding even that's problematic. Um, so there's advice um, that uh, that body uh, did that says this is actually a better system. Law enforcement supports this. I think it meets the legislature's intention for accountability in a way that why didn't we think of it, I don't know, 10 years ago? Well, we didn't. Um, but that's also the exercise of learning uh, from, from practice. So uh, I do recommend that. And I think that uh, establishing through the Sheriff's Operations Director, establishing uh, effectively a model board, which is already done in the internal uh, investigations policy, but establishing a model board uh, in each county um, would make sense. Uh, talking with Vermont leagues, cities, and towns, uh, they generally will reflect on a municipal police department, uh, their board, their elected board being the representatives. We contract with elected boards. So in my policy, it says I'm going to have a, a representative from towns I contract with serve as my, uh, my citizens advisory, uh, for lack of better words. Um, so I think having a concept that is carried across all 14 counties uh, makes sense. I think the sheriff's operations director uh, can develop that policy, um, which is effectively the model internal affairs policy, uh, which then says we're going to do this the same way in each county. It just makes sense to do it. And then we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. Uh, I could talk for hours on sustainable funding models. I don't think I have the support of my association to say any one is the favorable one. Um, I think that there's a willingness and desire uh, for my association to have uh, open, honest, uh, transparent discussions about how that works. 
but simply um, we could talk for hours and be nowhere further. Uh, I think that uh, that's an issue to uh, discuss long-term and establish uh, what we can do. Person Cooper, go ahead. In, in those terms, following up on her question, you don't have a set allocation of positions. You basically fund or hire as many as you can fund um, based on need, of course. In a true business sense, I hire based on need. I do not have an allocation of personnel slots. I have an allocation of funds that I can sustain under state and federal law. Mm -hmm. um, but that is also always with anticipation of what's next year bring. Um, going to backtrack with my agency's history to about 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, we had done a, a pilot program for electronic monitoring, um, which I think might become important in current discussions in the legislature around uh, bail reforms. Um, that said, I'm going to skip it other than say we did a, a pilot. We hired, I think it was six people in anticipation of that pilot project. And then we had a town say, we want you 24 seven, here's your contract. And that was done in March. They wanted us to start July 1st. So we took those well, four of the six positions and applied them to that town's contract while we went to recruit for the pilot program that ultimately, while it was uh, established July 1st, it wasn't really operationalized till September. So we had three months, about six months to figure out how to staff the pilot project. We're constantly playing that game. Um, call it firefighting, call it uh, being resourceful, creative, nimble. We don't, we don't have positions like a municipality or the state do. We don't have position numbers. We have ability and opportunity. Uh, Increasing the efficiency of delivery of public safety services offered by sheriff's departments. Again, I can talk for hours of this. Um, we're talking about duplicity of services. Uh, why are we paying for three dispatches in Wyndham County when we need one? We are. Can't tell you why. We're actually paying for more, but that's more nuanced. Um, why are we paying for policing, uh, duplication of policing in Wyndham County? Variety of reasons. Organic Vermont did the Vermont thing. We brought it together. It's just where we're at. Um, so I don't think it's about the efficiency of delivery of services by the Sheriff's Department. We're already pretty efficient under the concept of economics. The state's not efficient in how it allocates resources. That's an opportunity of a far bigger problem of numerous issues, dispatching, EMS, fire, mental health, flood response, that's a big one. Um, and we share a common thread with the conversation. We're happy to be partners in the conversation, uh, but I can spend probably weeks on that conversation. Um, and I'm going to withhold all further comments for the sake of your time. So uh, I know we have a lot of things to cover. I was hoping that uh, this would be an opportunity. I think it has been for us to <clears throat> look at what progress has been made and what questions still remain unanswered uh, after Act 30. And we knew we weren't gonna, um, you know, we're just a few months into most of that being, I don't know. In effect, I guess I'd ask you the same question that I asked to Annie and Roger, which is, um, you know, are there, are there specific legislative pieces that we need to be looking at in this short session? Um, and I think a few things have come up that we are gonna look at, like the uh, retirement piece, it's in H 585. Um, so that one's definitely on our to-do list to, to talk about. Um, but are there any things that, um, I know they mentioned specifically, potentially us looking at um, clarifying what happens if you have a non-certified uh, sheriff and yeah. their conversation would be. Yeah, so um, some of the discussion uh, with regards to the disagreement isn't necessarily a disagreement with Sheriff Marku on the fact that um, about what qualifications are necessary, it's how do we get there? Um, and so to that end, uh, I use an example, I know you've heard this chair, uh, but for the, the rest of the committee, um, I attended what was called the National Sheriff's Institute at the FBI Academy two years ago, I think. 
Um, and in the class of, I think, 27 sheriffs from around the country, uh, a question was posed, who here is not certified? Or I think it was who was certified and all but one racer. So the one sheriff, uh, Sheriff uh, Huston, uh, she is from Orleans County, uh, I'm sorry, Orleans Parish, Louisiana. Uh, she is not a certified law enforcement officer. She was elected in her county with the background that she's an attorney who is an independent police monitor for the Department of Justice. She is the person who comes into agencies that are under federal consent decrees, uh, said plainly. She's the person who comes in when the federal government says, you are acting so wrong and so bad that we need to give you an adult. What a cool background. What happens when we have a retired federal agent, FBI, uh, U.S. Marshal, uh, who comes in and says, I'm running for sheriff. They don't have a level three certification. And so it's like there are all these opportunities for a professional uh, objective manager or leader to come into a sheriff's office. General Knight, maybe he retires from the military and says, I want to be sheriff. That would be really cool. Um, but he doesn't have a level three law enforcement certification despite his background as a, a military police, I think, battalion commander. Um, so where do we define the lines? What are the required qualifications? We need leaders. We need people who can be objective and reasonable. We need people who administer their agencies that are incredibly complicated systems. I can't necessarily give you a definitive list, but I can give you definitive examples. Um, to Annie's point, I completely agree that why am I paid differently uh, than a person with uh, a lesser qualification? I think we can, we can wrap our head around that. What about a person with no qualification? Though? What do we do there? And so um, I, I think that as we talk about the, the issues with compensation, with benefits, um, there is a reasonable latitude of saying, well, if you are certified, you get this. If you have these qualifications, you get this. If you're not, you get this. Um, I think there's opportunities uh, in statute to say, if you have had due process, it's the government. So the Constitution says we can't deprive a person without property, money, uh, without due process. If due process by a court of law has been, uh, has, let's say, been completed, well, can the state limit salary? I don't see an issue with that. I completely agree with Sheriff Marcoux uh, in saying, hey, if you've done wrong, why can't we restrict it to your salary? I'm concerned about, uh, I'm, I'm concerned how that process works, but I don't think that there's not a way there. I'll say that better. I think there's a way to get there. And I think that reasonable people can get there. So I don't want to see sheriffs punished just because um, they have a title of sheriff. I want to see sheriffs held to an objectively reasonable standard. And I think the work that this committee did last year got us there. Um, I'm, I enjoy coming here to testify because we can get there. Uh, and it takes good, honest, open testimony to do that. Other questions for Sheriff Anderson? I think he will be making other appearances here on some of these issues <laughs> <sounds> later <laughs> in the session. <laughs> but uh, Representative Cooper, go ahead, please. Uh, maybe I can ask both of you, whatever the plural of sheriff is, uh, how much of the job is actually law enforcement as opposed to administrative? I, will I know it would differ between offices. Uh, I will speak to my agency. Um, I roughly... 25% of my contracts represent our revenue. So I say 25% of my organization is law enforcement. But I'm talking about sheriff person. That because I have about 41 people, there comes an immense amount of administrative work. And so I get involved on uh, serious crimes. Uh, I get involved uh, in a supervisory and review capacity uh, to ensure that we have met the standards, the burden of proof, that we have a uh, appropriately functioning uh, evidence locker, that we have uh, the right equipment for staff, that that's appropriately maintained. Um, I will uh, go, but if I were to give you my breakdown of the day, I probably spend less than four hours each week on average because about 32 to 34 to 36 hours each week 
is going to be administrative public records requests. I don't have staff that really does that. Like I, I pick up the slack on a lot of the things we're just not funded for. Or Annie does. Um, with the Lamoille County, uh, I meet with my uh, patrol people, uh, my commanders every morning. Uh, and I go over activities, uh, you know, yesterday's activities, reports, uh, you know, investigations. So I'm very, very involved uh, and have been for the entire 20 some odd years I've been the sheriff there. Uh, within six months, we had two devastating floods in Johnson. I was out there uh, and I think it was very important for people to see me out there uh, in uniform. Uh, getting wet and and uh, um, you know just just trying to be helpful. You know, envision this: if you have a heaven forbid a, a mass casualty incident, a shooting in the school or something. Um, you know, I'd hate to be the the person that wasn't certified in office to be able to go and and to participate and and try to help resolve that issue. So I, you know, I, I firmly believe with, you know, we've got 40, 43 years, 44 years experience. I firmly believe that every ounce of training and uh, that a potential sheriff uh, uh, can have, should have um, to do this job because we're, we're here because we're trying to take this to the next level and professionalize the sheriffs. So, and yep, there's, there's administration uh, and there's business uh, and politics involved in being a sheriff, but um, you should have the absolute uh, um, top level training that you can have if you're gonna do this job, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheriff Anderson. Appreciate you being with us this morning. Thank you. So committee, um, our last testimony and this first segment on these issues, I wanted to invite um, the Criminal Justice Council Executive Director, Heather Simons, to testify. Um, we'll take a quick break and then switch here. Uh, so Chief Clerk, we might be getting started just a little bit later than we have on the schedule. If that's okay, great, thank you. <laughs> Lots of reports coming our way. I'm trying to give the committee the opportunity to take them all in and see how they might influence our work on these topics. So uh, thanks everybody. Good morning, Heather, how are you? Good morning, I'm fine, how are you? Great, um, thanks for being with us this morning. I was wondering if you um, could just give us your um, feedback on uh, where we're at with Act 30 and um, with, from the Criminal Justice Council's perspective. Yes, thank you for the record. Uh, Heather Simons, I'm the executive director for the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, and um, I wanna thank the committee for the invitation this morning. I honestly don't have a lot to add to the testimony from my colleagues earlier. I think that Sheriff Marku and Annie Noonan really covered um, the comp you know a comprehensive review, not only of the content, but also the process and our involvement as the council. Um, it was early on decided that uh, we would not take the lead. However, we did provide feedback and there was a presentation from state's attorneys and sheriff's office to the council and the council was invited again to provide feedback, which we did. I Just in terms of the bullet points, our investment obviously is around professionalism and training. Um, I agree with everyone that the level two and level three discussion is a little complicated. I also don't think that it's impossible to figure out. And from um, our position as a council that supports the professionalism and training and readiness for all law enforcement, I think uh, committee members, you know that um, we are very interested in being clear about 
what the jobs are and the job descriptions in terms of what's expect expected, and then to provide training and support and resources from there. And uh, we're ex uh, very involved, as you know, with a three-year project around um, curriculum review that is being driven by what the state of Vermont will um, find out is all law enforcement's opinion and assessment on uh, job duties. And that's gonna be, I think that that's a critical conversation for this committee and with regards to uh, the sheriff's report because of the discussions around what is, you know, what is the most critical skill to have and does it come through certification and um, additional training or as Sheriff Anderson said, um, there are other ways to, uh, to outline uh, leadership knowledge, skills and abilities. And a lot of it has to do with seasoned experience and relevant skills, but also in 21st century policing, we know that resilience, stamina, and knowledge of systems is really important. So that's the that is really in a nutshell how I'd like to um, hopefully complement uh, what my colleague said earlier and be available to answer any questions. Um, one of the open items that we had um, from our discussion last year that we didn't take action on in Act 30 um, was the question of um, Category B um, complaints, the, when the first complaint is made, um, the discretion that might be given to the Criminal Justice Council um, to act on a first complaint rather than waiting for a second complaint. Um, I'm wondering if the council's taking a position on that in the interim. I, not officially, and um, I have, um, I had mentioned to Andrea that if there was going to be a deeper dive into into that discussion, that we have Kim McManus on standby if you had some questions, um, and uh, not that I'm not willing to jump in, but she's really the pro. Yeah, I think I think if the committee does want to take a deeper dive into picking up that conversation, we'll do that separately. And I'll I'll invite both you and <clears throat> Ms. McManus and your chair and to give testimony on that as well as others. So I didn't want to take us down a rabbit hole today, but wanted to flag it as a topic. Yes, I appreciate that. I mean, it's it is a bit of a rabbit hole, so I'm just being a little cautious. Not that I don't love to. <laughs> you know, open a can of worms. <laughs> Understood. Um, other questions for Heather and the, the CJC's perspective on this? Great. Well, thank you for being with us and being part of the conversation today. I really appreciate it. Yep, you're welcome. Thank Great. you. Committee. So maybe I was totally wrong, which is so often the case with trying to judge the uh, timing on things. So uh, what I would like to do is take a short break uh, before we switch gears and look at the LEAB uh, report. So um, we'll break now. Good morning. Welcome back to the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. Um, we're picking up our morning testimony uh, with a report out of the Law Enforcement Advisory Board. And I uh, appreciate Chief Cook being with us this morning. Welcome back. Morning. Good to see everybody. For the record, my name is Sean Burke. I have the privilege of serving as the Chief of Police in the City of South Burlington. This morning, I'm here in my capacity as the Chair of the Law Enforcement Advisory Board. And uh, <clears throat> of course, we uh, take up issues identified by the legislature each year. And uh, this in this past year, uh, the front burner issue was the domestic violence involving law enforcement employees model policy. And we also took up a, a leftover from the 2011 session on a model policy geared toward uh, assaults that occur within the healthcare setting. And uh, in advancing that work, I'll talk about the domestic violence policy first. Uh, we were charged with convening stakeholders to address a number of uh, policy gaps, we'll say, from the uh, last published policy, which was 2010 and uh, kind of coalescing all of those um, 
all those ideas into a new policy that was ultimately approved by the LAAB at our December meeting. And uh, we were able to have that in place by our statutory uh, guideline of January 1. And now uh, over the next six months, uh, the Vermont Police Academy will be working on a training curriculum uh, for all law enforcement officers on domestic violence more globally, but there will be focus time on the new policy. And then agencies will have to have the essential elements of the model policy in place by July 1 of 2024. And that all appears to be tracking. As it pertains to the, uh, the work that was done on the 2011 uh, policy involving assaults on healthcare workers, uh, Department of Public Safety did uh, excellent work uh, Will DeWhite did, uh, convened a lot of stakeholders, a lot of research, got probably 90% of the policy done, unable to connect with folks from the emergency medicine community, EMS. So uh, we look to identify a partner in the Vermont EMS community here in early 2024 to work with Wilda, get gain their perspective on the policy, and uh, hopefully have that ready for LEAB review by, say, midpoint of, uh, of this year, uh, say, in June. We're, by statute, we meet six times a year. So I, I anticipate that we'll have uh, ample time to <clears throat> take that up. One observation throughout um, my last, I've served as the chair of the LEAB for the last, uh, I guess, almost three years now. Observation over the last couple of years is that a number of state model policies have been enacted or either enacted as new or taken up for revision. And there's, I think, a little bit of uh, coordination that could be done better in terms of who is tasked to do what. So uh, ultimately, the LEAB are criminal justice practitioners. We don't have a staff um, liaison. We do not have design. We don't have designated counsel. So this work really defaults to the Department of Public Safety. And I recently talked with Commissioner Morrison about this, and we think that it's logical that it does. However, there should be a, a, an acknowledgement that the policy construct in review is actually work that is being essentially assigned to the Department of Public Safety. And then it is um, really the purview of the LEAB to make sure that we um, gather the relevant stakeholders and take public testimony at our meetings and which then what happens is DPS takes that relevant information and reworks the policy and brings it back for ultimate approval. And uh, we feel that process is, um, is, is an effective one, but isn't always necessarily clearly delineate, delineated when the work is handed down from the legislature. There's also times where the LEAB will ultimately review and publish the policy that is assigned. And then there are other times that uh, we do the, all of the same work and then ultimately present it to the Vermont Criminal Justice Council for their approval. Um, whether or not there's really uh, deliberate intention in that regard, we don't know, but we took the opportunity in this year's report to highlight that observation kind of from the tactical or implementation side of the equation, if you will. I'm happy to answer any questions that folks may have. Yeah, so it sounds like uh, there's essentially three three chunks of uh, things for us to think about. One is the work that came out of H-476. And if um, so, I'll kind of start there. It sounds like the um, domestic violence uh, model policy is on track and will be adopted by agencies uh, and is just kind of rolling out. Um, do you have a do you have a sense of what the timeline looks like around that? And were there any particular points of contention around trying to get that policy issued? No, there were no points of contention. Uh, strong work by the by the network uh, helping us on the victim or survivor side of the equation. Again, uh, a lot of police departments already had in place uh, good operational policy in this regard. And uh, I thought the process was really effective. And again, we're just meeting our, uh, the expectations are set uh, by you folks and outlined uh, by the letter of the law. So it is published uh, on our website. It is adopted by the LEAB. And it's a policy that you know, agency heads are going to have to be thoughtful in how to implement. It's not a copy-paste document. You're really going to have to think about, you know, as an agency head, you're going to have to think about what you have in terms of resources, early intervention programs, 
how you actually would respond to an incident involving uh, domestic violence, and then whether uh, how you would respond to an employee of yours that is potentially either a perpetrator of or a survivor of domestic violence. So I think it's an excellent um, opportunity to really think about this. Um, domestic violence is prevalent in all areas of society. Law enforcement community is certainly not immune. And um, I think we're tracking in terms of the timeline. And uh, I look forward to seeing what, uh, what the Academy offers in terms of our in-service training in this regard. As you know, it's a even year. So part of our rule, I think it's still known as rule 13 training, our annual training mandates, because the balance is up. So it's all very timely. Any questions about the domestic violence involving law enforcement work that we did last year? Great to hear that the model policy is out. Things are on track. I always appreciate that. You know, a lot of uh, messages I got in December as a chair of a committee that had ordered a lot of reports mm -hmm. or other things to be created, uh, either in law or or just ask for information. I got a lot of like. Hey, we have a little bit more time to do our homework, so it's really nice when uh, something that's as important as this is happening on the timeline we laid out. <laughs> I should add one exclamation point to this. Department of Public Safety, uh, their attorney, Tucker Jones, he hit it out of the park. So uh, although, you know, in my role, do I coordinate meetings and get the people together? Yes. But Tucker was the person who rolled up his sleeves and got this work done. Great. Uh, well, if Commissioner Morrison doesn't hear that, I will definitely pass that along to her. Um, anybody else with questions on this part? Right. Um, we are going to be tomorrow afternoon hearing um, jointly with House Healthcare from emergency medical service providers and from the working group report um, that's more broad than the work that the LEAB was doing. Um, and so I think it's kind of timely to bring up their inclusion um, here. And I'm wondering if um, if there's anything that we should be particularly keeping our eyes onto. Um, it sounds like the work is kind of ongoing um, in dealing with the crimes against healthcare workers portion of the report. Yeah, I guess I'll just seize this moment to just put this uh, on the table. I think the crises that we're seeing in our emergency rooms or assault, uh, whether they're on police officers or EMS workers in the field, really are driven by um, the mental health crisis that's playing out and the lack of resources that we have for folks that are in crisis, posing a danger to themselves or others. And I know in Burlington, the emergency room is, not, is no longer a sought after post for healthcare professionals. And it's also a place that we see as you know, municipalities, both on the police and on the fire side, where we'll get sent to some type of incident involving a person that's in a crisis. And whether that's a situational crisis or a person with a formal diagnosis, ultimately the end game after 4 p.m. is to see if we can coach the person into going back to the e ER. And that's just simply an overwhelmed system of care. And uh, I think until we start looking left, of boom, left of incident, and to see where folks are falling out of whether they're community-based treatment options or, or whatever uh, options that the uh, mental health system tries to provide or can't provide, that some clear focus needs to be uh, given to that problem or issue. Because, you know, we hear a lot, right, about public safety. And I'll, I'll say, I've been doing this job for like 30 years now. Um, seems like yesterday, but we've got three things that are playing out in our communities that really tear at people's perception of public safety. The first is the substance use disorder crisis. The second is the mental health crisis. And the third in my assessment is the homeless crisis in the state. And uh, I do a lot of public speaking in South Burlington about what the police are actually responsible for and effective in doing. And we're not tooled for the first three. And uh, those overwhelmed systems of care or resources right now are really playing out in a way that are being cutting at Vermonters' perception of how safe they are in the places where they live, work, or recreate. Representative Marwicki, go ahead. Thank you for coming here. And uh, thanks for your work. Uh, your point about uh, security at hospital ETs is well taken. And I from Wyndham County with, with uh, Sheriff Anderson, we just had a, a significant issue with a, an individual, Brattleboro. 
recently, and it just highlights that these are not isolated incidents anymore. And I don't know if, if there's data that's being kept at incidences at VDs, but if there is, I think we need to look at that and see what, what we can do. I don't know, do you have a, a uniform person stationed at the hospital? So we don't have a hospital in, within the confines of the city of South Burlington. Um, during my career, I did spend a couple of decades in Burlington and yeah. the emergency room is located within uh, within Burlington. I know that uh, UVMMC has uniform professional security staff to what, uh, what levels of data they uh, keep. I don't know about. Obviously, the police department keeps uh, incident data as to what they respond to yeah. there. I don't know what that looks like. Um, coincidentally, my wife is a nurse uh, and worked for a long time in the emergency room. So I know anecdotally uh, where those nurses are no longer seeking employment. Yeah. yeah. It's story after story of people getting punched. More than, more than that, in, uh, how, do you, how do you provide health care in that situation? <laughs> So uh, I know that our colleagues up in judiciary, our colleagues in healthcare that we're meeting with tomorrow um, recognize this nexus between us needing to provide more resources to deal with folks who are experiencing mental health crisis that's collaborative with law enforcement. Um, I think you and many of your colleagues have been good partners in that. Um, you know, I think about what my chief uh, Lamoth is doing in St. Albans PD and partnering with our designated agency um, and I'm wondering if part of the exploration of the LAAB's, you know, model policy work in regard to, to this is, um, you know, more integration, especially with uh, uh, the hospital-based social workers and, um, and sort of recognizing some of these things before they become an assault or, or a problem. Um, <clears throat> but I think there's some big infrastructure things that we're trying to tackle uh, in multiple committees that are more upstream than the incidents and the actual, by the time somebody gets to an emergency room and they're experiencing a crisis that might eventually involve law enforcement, um, we were probably a little too late. But yeah, I don't know if there's any discussion about things that we need to think about around empowering law enforcement to work more collaboratively with the mental health system we have or things like that that are coming into this conversation. So again, in Chittenden County, we are fortunate uh, with our designated partner. We have uh, what's called the community outreach team, which is uh, a co-response model. Kind of, I uh, call it a hand in glove. They do a lot of proactive work as well. I find it much more effective than the embedded model. And uh, we see you know, success there, but we also see growing uh, service level demands in the field. And uh, you know, community outreach exists on kind of a, I think it, there's three funding streams, you know, some uh, some money from the Vermont Department of Mental Health, a lot of money from UVMMC, and then the subscribing towns individually, we all pay, uh, pay to play, essentially on an incident-based uh, formula. And that is that has been a very good model. However, it's de dealing with the crisis in the field and we're not getting upstream, right? So that's the problem. I don't think the problem lies with the level of collaboration between law enforcement and community-based providers, but rather the overwhelmed systems of care that have led this person to be in crisis. And that, I'm pretty bold when I say this, you know, if, if our only response is government, if you're in a parking lot in a mental health crisis and it with no one to help you, and our only solution is a police officer, I think would fail. <clears throat> Don't think any of us would argue on that point. Questions for cheaper on that one. Got a lot of work to do in this building. <laughs> Some of these problems, I, I think, as as much as they seem, they can seem intractable. Um, I think we we are making some progress in terms of the funding beds and changing a little bit of some of the entrenched thinking around some of these issues. Uh, they're not necessarily gov ops, but some of these places where the model policies, the way we train law enforcement, the things that are in our jurisdiction here bump up against some of these bigger challenges that are, you know, healthcare. We're going to work collaboratively with our colleagues. And I'm interested to bring some of the perspective that you're sharing with us today into our conversations tomorrow with the EMS personnel and the healthcare community. Um, 
Great. Anything else we should know, Chief Burke? No, I, I had a blank slate coming in, and I appreciate that. Uh, I hope that I conveyed the information that you need um, relevant to the work of the LEAB, and we look forward to seeing what's uh, maybe what's in store. I know the domestic violence fatality review uh, review commission report I think was delivered yesterday, and uh, I think there's a notion that the LEAB might look at a standardized report uh, slash affidavit for domestic violence in the state, and if that is our charge, we'll happily take it up. Um, I, I did want to go back. I'm sorry. I just kind of blanked on it to um, the call that you had for us to look at what is the LA, LAAB's role and how is it really supported by the Department of Public Safety? And I don't think I've ever really thought about it the way that you presented it. But if we're tasking the LAAB to review and develop mm -hmm. policy, we need to think about the administrative support that it needs is, is how I understood your testimony, am I, am I getting that? Yes, yeah, so that work defaults to the Department of Public Safety. And I think, um, you know, uh, some consideration should be given when it's the uh, mandate is made that the LAB is gonna do this, that there's a recognition, a public recognition that the Department of Public Safety policy and legal team uh, does that policy construct. And then the LAB fo functions as it was designed you know, professional practitioners from the criminal justice system, reviewing it from a variety of different perspectives and then approving it as model policy and publishing it as such. It, it seems analogous to me in the way we think about, you know, the Office of Professional Regulation staffing, you know, the Board of Medicine or something like that. Mm. Okay. Uh, you've given us an enormous amount to think about, Chief Break. Any other questions before... Uh... We let him out of the hot seat here. I had a quiet committee this morning. There's a lot going on in this building. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do is um, sort of, we'll take in what we heard from both um, the Act 30 report and this. Um, what I think may happen as we stack up some of these recommendations and take a little bit more testimony in between doing other work is that we might try to put together a committee bill that's a uh, kind of miscellaneous law enforcement. I actually um, had asked uh, Tim Devlin at Legislative Council to put a little committee bill that had a couple of the things that the Criminal Justice Council had mentioned to us and get some draft language together. So as we take some of this testimony that's a little bit, we may have kind of a miscellaneous public safety bill that will come together over the coming weeks. So. If there are recommendations that, you know, the folks who are involved in law enforcement agencies, you know, we'll be hearing from the Criminal Justice Council quite a bit um, about some of their ongoing work and updating training. I mean, I think while we've got you, Chief Burke, one of the things that I'm wanting us to hear from law enforcement agency heads is, you know, we're, we're in the middle of a three-year proposal to kind of modernize the way we do training in law enforcement. And, um, if there are things that we need to be doing this year in order to sort of stay on track and help make it easier for you to recruit and retain officers, I'm sure that you're experiencing some of the same hiring challenges that other agency heads are. <laughs> so don't open up a whole can of worms, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to know we are paying attention to that and trying to see what we can do to make it a little easier. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say briefly, uh, because I'm, I'm here, uh, I really appreciate the work that the director has taken up with the council in terms of an accredited standard, whether it's iAtalyst or otherwise, I think that's important. But what can't be lost on us is that we still operate today. And uh, although we may not love exactly how we've been training uh, and how we've been um, reporting to the council, we still have to have clear standards in place while we transition. So uh, the council and the academy are, you know, another another entity that have a huge lack of resources, like the rest of us. Uh, and this change is going to take some time. And, uh, you know, I think I'll just use this by way of example, you know, there'll be a change this year. So 2024 and our rule 13 training requirements where we need to capture more data about the uh, CD of the instructors, the exact for the precise number of hours that we spend in these trainings. And then we're gonna hold that apparently internally as a police agency. And then if it becomes of interest, we'll need to report that to the council. Um, you know, so some of these incremental processes can be tedious at times, 
as opposed to building a really clear roadmap to in 36 months, this is exactly where we're going to be. We're going to be IATALYST uh, certified. All of the courses that are uh, offered or, or credentialed by IATALYST will be counted and accredited and, uh, and you need to report as such. That's easier process for government to respond to. We always need a little bit of a runway. Okay, I think uh, that, that that feedback has been shared with me by some of your colleagues who are other agency heads. So I thought I might hear a similar recommendation. So we will be in dialogue with the Criminal Justice Council about how uh, these updated standards and requirements are rolling out. Um, but I think that may be some of the focus of our uh, testimony when we have Director Simons and uh, Chair Sorrell back in. So thanks for sharing your perspective on the spot. <laughs> Um, great. So uh, thank you, Chief Burton. I think we're all set on that report work this morning. Um, yeah. Thank so, you. So what we're going to do, committee, um, a little bit early, I want to have some time um, to work on my uh, memo, capturing our thoughts uh, on BAA. Um, I did ask uh, Maria Royal um, to put together a little draft sentence to capture um, sentiment of the committee yesterday around the $9 million uh, OPS grant money, uh, getting a, a check back and sign off from the Public Safety Communications Task Force. So I expect that. Um, so we'll try to share that to everybody, but given the timing, I'm just communicating that sentiment in my memo that I'm writing. Um, we are gonna pick up our work uh, after lunch at one o'clock on uh, H649. And I wanted to relay to the committee as we're thinking about that, um, that uh, legislative council and um, general counsel from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission had checked in with the commissioners and got the feedback that um, they do not need to have any ability to meet with the groups uh, that we had talked about. So I think the language that we looked at yesterday probably gets us um, where we are if we um, given that feedback. Um, so we still have a couple of items to look, look into though. Yeah. Did they give an indication about staffing the groups or? Uh, no, it was just the only feedback I got was about the commissioners attending. So if you want to look into that or do that with me, I'm happy to do that, but did not, did not get any feedback on that particular point. Um, great. And then I wanted to remind everybody that there is the National Guard um, second session today. I'm going to also use our early break here to make sure that I can make that this week. So <laughs> I will be attending. I hope uh, folks will join me. Um, but other than that, I'll see you all uh, back here at one. So we'll adjourn and go off live for now. <laughs>